Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii show about association living. We've been doing this for over a year now and had tremendous response by owners and board members alike as they like the education we're providing. A couple of weeks ago, we started a review of Hawaii Revised Statutes, the condo law, 514B. We're about halfway through it. And uh, we said it was a four-part series, but it looks like it's going to be a five- or six-part series before we're done with it. I'll bet you it's eight. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I have to my left the guy, my expert on this, Scott Shirley, Director of Training for Associa. And we're going to be continuing on with uh, records with regard to that. Welcome yep. back, Scott. Well, thank you for having me and, and unlocking me so I could come and do the yeah. show. <laughs> well, my nightmare has returned, <laughs> all I can say. But anyway, let me say this. We have an exciting thing today. Before we begin the 514B, we have a call-in question. I think that's exciting because people are starting to watch. And have I questions. think that's very exciting. And so I've got this question I'm going to share with every you and me. We're going to talk about it briefly before yep. we get back to 514B. But I do want to tell all of our viewers that if you have a question, we encourage you to contact us and join our conversation at 415-871-2474. And uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. And it doesn't have to be on our topic. It can be about any association issue. But let's go right to our viewer's question. And it is as follows. I was verbally assaulted and threatened by the site manager and board director of my condo over my dog being too aggressive. They threatened to kick my dog out of our home. After being verbally threatened, we were sent a citation as well as a letter of compliance that had stipulation and terms we needed to comply with if we wanted to keep our dog. When we attempted to explain ourselves at the board meeting, the president of the board cut us off, didn't allow us to explain ourselves. My question basically is as follows. Did the board of directors properly operate within its judicial powers, and what are our rights from an anonymous viewer? No. So the issue is really clear, but let me, let me begin saying this is kind of a, uh, a topic I've been talking about previously, that first of all, number one, boards and employees of associations like the resident manager, site manager, should always treat the owners with respect. Absolutely. They have to learn how to talk to people and discuss issues in a professional tone and never should be threatening, although we're taking uh, this question kind of verbatim and what one people may find insulting or threatening may be uh, in the eyes of the other person not so insulting and threatening. But I think it's incumbent upon the association to do everything within their ability to, number one, treat that owner with respect, and try to communicate with them in a professional manner. That being said, with regard to house rules, yep. and certainly they have to have rules for pets in an association for, from sanitation to other reasons. Um, for a house rule to really be enforces, forcible, forcible, you know, there has to be a right of appeal to the board of directors. So when that owner goes to the board of directors, that board should be respectful to them, give them a chance for a fear hearing to explain themselves, and more times than not, this is done by invitation to an executive session, so we don't have to drag the neighbors in and everybody else, and they can have a, 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 a conversation in private about what the issues are, hearing both sides uh, before coming across, hopefully, a resolution. Finally, though, based on what this uh, question was, let's just assume that the board didn't give them a hearing, and let's just assume that uh, the site manager wasn't as professional as we would like. What are your options? My answer is what I've been saying all along. We have a law called Act 187 that for a very nominal amount of money, an owner can request that the matter be uh, mediated with a retired judge by going to a company like Dispute Prevention Resolution or DPR. And if the viewer wants more information, he can call the hotline and uh, after the show, we'll give him how to contact them. But if he really feels it's, a, it's been unfair and unreasonable and he can't get the board to meet with them, he should then file for an Act 187 mediation to have it uh, properly resolved. With, and, and the current laws before the legislature make it mandatory to the extent that the boards don't have a choice about whether they want to go to mediation or not. And maybe just that filing will cause a catalyst for them to invite them back or exactly. her back and uh, talk about it. What do you think of my thoughts? Well, I think your thoughts are right in line. I also realize that whenever you're dealing with pets or children, that is a very emotional issue. Um, so handling it in executive session is probably a good idea so that 
you can calmly discuss the issue at hand instead of having a room full of emotions. Um, and again, like you said, we, we're, we're seeing one side of the story and we're just assuming that this is actually what happened. But I think when one of the things you pointed out is the board and any employee of the board, like the resident manager, um, should treat all owners with respect. But I think that goes both ways, too, that the owners at a board meeting have to realize that this is a voluntary position. They're not getting paid to be up there having uh, these board meetings. So the um, mutual uh, respect should go both ways as well. Yeah, I guess that's summary that I'd recommend for this uh, viewer now is, again, write the board uh, a letter or an email and saying, look, we didn't get a chance to discuss this thoroughly at the last meeting. I'd like to attend the next board meeting and executive session and discuss this further. If they can't get any opportunity to be heard, then consider following an Act 187 of mediation. Absolutely. If they really feel the demands in the letter are unfair based on the circumstances. And I'll point out that, just as an example for me, if my wife had to choose between me or the dog in a scenario like this, well, there's no choice. I'll, I'll, I'll be knocking on your door. Yeah, I have nothing to afraid of. So <laughs> please be nice to your wife. That's the last thing I need in my life. You know. Anyway, back to the real purpose of today's show. And I'll, let me again thank the viewer for uh, contacting us. If you have more questions, uh, and want to talk after the show, we can do that, or, or you're certainly welcome to call the hotline at any time. This is the purpose of the show, to discuss these things. And to all the boards out there, treat your owners with respect, discuss things with them, have open minds, and try to find resolutions, and at last resort, go to Act 187 Mediation. So let's go back to uh, the intended purpose of the show, which is 514B, the Hawaii Condominium Law. I would tell all the viewers that there's uh, bills before the legislature today to abolish or repeal 514A, yep. so, and that's moving along quite steadily, so it's probable that uh, come July 1 or some early date of a, a, enactment that the 514A will go away and we'll only be dealing with 514B. So far we've discussed government structure, declaration, bylaws, house rules. Yep. We've discussed meetings, annual meetings, board meetings, executive sessions, those types of things. And, and what I want to talk about now is just briefly, let's just review the difference between an annual and a board meeting. That's, your, that's, that's your me. Oh, okay. Well, the annual meeting is, we call it an annual meeting, but I like to refer to it as the owner's meeting because that's really where the owners participate. It happens once a year. Um, owners have a lot more discussion going on of what's happening at the condo. They can make motions from the floor um, and things like that. They can also have somebody other than themselves representing them at the annual meeting by way of a proxy. The board meetings, on the other hand, again, owners do have a right to participate, um, but that is only open to owners of record. And it's basically the day-to-day -day business uh, that is being discussed. And it can happen monthly, quarterly, um, I'd hate to have an association that are having them weekly because <laughs> that's just too much. But I've seen that after like a hurricane or something like that when you've had a major event. But oh yeah, but I think the important thing I want to emphasize to everybody is when you're in a board meeting, it's a regular meeting. Sometimes it's a special meeting for a limited purpose. Mm -hmm. But if it's a regular meeting, you can only go into an executive session from a regular meeting. You have to have yes. a regular meeting and adjourn to an executive session. And under the statute, you have to announce what you're going in for. And then at the end of the meeting, you have to come back out and within reasonable description of what you did in the executive session. You certainly wouldn't want to disclose any contract negotiations or litigation settlements, something that might impair your right to, it's not a final decision, it's a discussion. Yes, exactly. You wouldn't want to impair your right with regard to what you disclose, but you certainly have to tell the owners what you're going in for. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and have that meeting. And I, I think it's also important to point out that the legislature actually had to go back into 514B and clarify executive session because it was being abused. Right. Um, some boards would call a board meeting to order and then immediately go into executive session and basically have the entire board meeting in executive session. So they had to clarify in 514B what you could go into executive session for. And your opinion, should they take minutes in executive session? It's a good question. Um, I always have, and I believe you have as well, and the recommendation is, yeah, take minutes uh, for the executive session. Now, can an owner request those minutes? 
No, of course not. No. But those minutes in, let's say, litigation can be subpoenaed. I've actually heard from some attorneys that say, don't take minutes in the executive session, then there's nothing you can subpoena. Well, then there is. They subpoena you, right. and then you have to testify. So it's better to have the minutes. And it's interesting, before the legislature this year, there's a bill with respect to this that basically um, puts some breach of fiduciary duty obligations on a board if they don't do certain things. Mm -hmm. And the safe harbor is if the minutes reflect they voted against whatever this particular issue was. So again, that would be a reason why in executive session you'd want to uh, take minutes to, so you can make sure your position is protected in yes. case there is a problem down the road. But um, there's a lot of opposition to this uh, breach of fiduciary duty language uh, in the statute. So I don't know if that'll come out of, the, of that particular bill. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's telling you the legislature is looking at it anyway, and it's certainly telling you that your vote, whether it be in regular or executive session, should be clear so you have that safe harbor if something goes wrong down the road. Well, not only that, I've actually seen bylaws that says that mandate that in the minutes each board member's vote must be indicated in the minutes. Um, because I had an owner accuse me of not doing it by the board bylaws, and I said, well, yeah, the bylaws say board member what their vote was, board member what their vote was. But when the vote's unanimous, that's basically saying all the board members voted unanimous, yeah. so it wasn't necessary to put their name down each time that's right. that they voted. If the minute header lists all the people and you say unanimous, that's yep. adequate, you know. Yep. But the state law requires you to record when it's not a unanimous vote like that, the individual vote of each, mm -hmm. of each director. And again, it's a safe harbor for you if you voted against something and the board did something that comes back to pose some liability on you or the association, that you have a safe harbor that you didn't yep. support the decision. So now that we've been through almost half our show, we haven't even got the records <laughs> yet. <laughs> I hope we're not doing this in December. You know? uh, well, maybe November. Yeah, but after you, Thanksgiving, we'll move on to another records, subject. Right? Yeah, records. Yeah, that's one of the largest RICO complaints today is where boards or management companies refuse to give records to owners. It's one of the no yes, it is. highest number of complaints and the law is very clear, in my opinion, almost clear. Is anything clear with the law? But <laughs> I get lawyers, I don't know if I'm clear. But either way, records have to be provided. But the law identifies the records. Let's start out with financial records. Yep. Do they have to provide financial records? Um, up to a point. Um, it depends on what financial records are, are being requested. And also, just a little bit of clarification, the statute actually says these are the records you're entitled to request. But if you're doing a resale and working with a realtor who is requesting records, the records that those realtors want um, in a resale is basically disclosure. What's the maintenance fee? What's coming up? So their request for certain documents is not nearly as long as what an owner is entitled to. Because right. basically they just want to give you the a, a, a synopsis of what's going on at the association so the buyer can make an educated decision. And let me just summarize that because we're going to take a break after I summarize Okay. It. So for the financial statements, it's very clear. The latitude spells it out. They've been entitled to financial statements, check registers. They're entitled to know the delinquencies over 90 days. You know, they're entitled to contracts. They're entitled to journals, receivable accounts receivable, accounts payable journals. The statute specifically tells you what financial records you're entitled yes, to does. have. And so there shouldn't be any question about providing those to owners. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break. Hi, everyone. Ted Rolson here, host of our Think Tech show, Where the Drone Leads. And a lot of you, of course, have been setting your clocks at uh, uh, 4 o'clock on Friday so that you can make sure you see our show. It's now changed. It's now going to be at noon on Thursdays. Noon on Thursdays, new standard time for Where the Drone Leads. And where the drone leads is to systems like this, capabilities that we're using here in Hawaii these days, and we need you to pay attention to this and be part of it. So see you at noon on Thursdays. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and look forward to seeing you at Education Matters on Tuesdays with me, Carol Mon Lee. Hey everybody, it's me, Ian Davidson, host of a new show here at Think Tech called On The Go. What are you going to get during that show? I can't tell you. I can only tell you that it's going to be fun, and it's going to be sometimes, and I'm going to have a good time, and I hope that you do too. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here at Think Tech. This is just another one. Take a chance on it. See how you like it. Thanks for watching.
Well, we're back at Condo Insider talking about 514B and what records need to be produced by law to an owner who requests it. And we've started with financial records. And basically that includes the financial statement. That's going to include the general ledger, accounts receivable journal, accounts payable journal, a check register, those types of uh, financial records. But the statute clearly spells them out with respect to that. And one of the things is on delinquencies, it's always been those delinquencies over 90 days. Yes. So the ones that are less than 90 days, you don't have to provide. So I'm an owner and I want to see your ledger, not my own personal ledger, but I'm an owner there and I want to see another owner's ledger. Can I ask for that? No. Uh, my ledger is my ledger and you know, what purpose would you have uh, if it's over 90 days and you have a right to see it, but if I'm not over 90 days... And my question was, can you ask for it? And the answer oh, is yes, you could ask for it, but you're never <laughs> going to get it because it's not your it's, it's personal privacy information. You know, no, knowing you the way I, I should have expected that. I <laughs> know. You know, I may not invite you back anymore, but if you, you don't get my questions right, you know. But anyway, no, they can't get other people's no. ledgers. I even had an owner request once for me. They wanted to see bank statements, and they wanted to see like the signature card for opening up the association's trust account. Yep. Well, you know, in the privacy world, signatures can be stolen. And oh, in the absolutely. world of electronic banking, there's privacy numbers in there. Bank statements and signature cards are not listed as documents nope. you can get copies of. And certainly a board could voluntarily do it by redacting, blacking out the privacy information to protect themselves. But uh, the statute is pretty clearly thought through to give information to owners on the financial status without... Uh, taking away people's rights to privacy. Well, and, and another respect too, you know, you're living in a condominium, it's a business, it's a miniature government, and you're the taxpayer. So you have a right to see certain documents, but that right only goes so far. And also a lot of times, if it's controversial information that you may be entitled to, the statute even says, you may have to have to sign an affidavit in order to receive right. that material. So that's the financial record side of it. How about annual meetings, proxies and balloting and voting and things like that? Can they see that? They absolutely do. And since you threw one out at me, I'm going to throw one out at you. A lot of times, especially in a resale, uh, they request minutes of the last three board meetings and minutes of the last annual meeting. And the annual meeting happened 60 or 90 days ago. Commonly, sometimes the response is, well, we can't give you those minutes because they haven't been approved. And that's the wrong response. That's, uh, darn, I didn't trip you. <laughs> well, first of all, the more common practice today is that in the script of the annual meeting, they give the board the right to approve mm -hmm. the minutes. And so at the next board meeting, they're approving the annual meeting minutes. So they are approved minutes, which doesn't prohibit the assembly or the owners at the next meeting from amending or correcting those minutes at the next annual. If, if there's an error. But also because they're draft minutes, if they don't have a meeting, within 60 days of their annual meeting, by law they have to provide the draft minutes. So that's the answer. Yeah, you, you are correct, unfortunately. That's right. <laughs> See, you failed to fool me this time. But anyway, so it's, it's, but I think it's a critical thing to know that on proxies and voting, they can see them after the meeting is adjourned, mm -hmm. and they have to make the request within 30 days. Within 30 days, and they might be wanting to double check to make sure the proxies yeah. were in the right form or double checking ballots on, on votes. Yeah. And the common problem made in that area is, is that you know, people, you know, sometimes in the political world we live in, they're fighting for proxies. And they want to say, yep. how many proxies are there? Who's got what? Only the managing agent and the secretary is supposed to have that information. And they're not supposed to disclose it to anybody except if 10 people gave you their proxy, they could tell you you have 10 proxies from these 10 people. But you couldn't find out what other people have, what the exactly. board has, whatever. And the only way you get that is after the meeting is adjourned, then the owners have the right to request within 30 days to inspect not only the proxies, but the tally sheets, the voting, the ballots, those types of and things. And I think both you and I have experienced that where somebody was told over the phone or whatever, email, you have my proxy, but they didn't give that person the proxy. And then at the annual meeting, they're very upset because they told me I can have that proxy. Well, a lot of things can happen between the time they oh. tell you and the time the proxy is sent. Yeah, out. absolutely. It can be manipulated and the law is very clear for a proxy to be valid. 
it's got to be turned in 432 days before the yep. meeting. And, and I've had lots of circumstances. They say they sent it. and But did they really send it or not? They just told the owner they sent it. And you just don't know. But yep. the, the law doesn't give you any wiggle room. It's 432 days before. And you either have it or you don't have it. And uh, it's the end of the story, you know. Uh, and so that's where it's got to go. Now, how about contracts? Can owners get copies of contracts? They can, and I believe um, the legislature is looking at that a lot more closely as well this year, um, because let's say that the very common one is, I want to see the resident manager's contract. But are there privacy issues by releasing that resident manager's contract? And I know for years you've been saying there's a lot of gray area that needs to be cleaned up in that. Well, you know, it's interesting because the federal laws on some prior old court cases, some attorneys take the position, I have a hard time with this, saying that the resident manager contracts really an employment agreement, so the statute requiring you to give contracts doesn't mean the resident manager's employment agreement. And then they go on to say because of certain privacy laws. Well, there's a bill before the legislature, I think two bills uh, today that have language in there that clarifies that owners are entitled to the right of the resident manager, in this case, contract, yep. and they can redact the social security number, his private cell phone, medical information, certain true privacy information, yes. but they can't redact compensation and job descriptions. Now, I want to caution everybody who's listening to the show that that law has not been passed yet. No, so, it has not yet. So we still have that controversy in the industry a little bit, although I personally say it's very much, we know what the president of the Bank of Hawaii makes, that you, know, you as a, uh, an owner have to pay maintenance fees by your agreement and the contract you have with the association when you bought your unit. I think that owners should be entitled to transparency and be able to oh, yeah. know what the senior person makes. And uh, yeah, there's some risk that can be used against you or in a social media campaign, but uh, so I've been told by some senators in our state that comes with the territory, comes with the job. If you want this kind of job, <laughs> get, get used to it. I guess we all know what the senators make, so I guess that's fair. Right? <laughs> so anyway, um, how about bids? You know, you're working on a bid, and so you're going to get a contract for spalling, and you got five bids. Do well, owners get the bids? Absolutely not, because they're still bids. As a matter of fact, sometimes bids are things that are discussed even in executive session because you don't want that information to be generally out there and the same would happen with a bid. You know, if an owner got the bid and his friend works for another company that's part of the bidding, they can pass on the information and that's why bids themselves are not part of that. That's correct. And I've actually had owners who are upset saying, I'm going to call everybody who bid on this and tell them I'm going to sue them if they take this job. <laughs> they didn't want the association to spend the money and so they had to pay for the cost, right? So, I mean, it's a, uh, but the truth of the matter is owners need to know that they're not entitled to bids. However, after the contract has been let and there's no apparent legal reason or some other reason, I see no harm in letting the bids go at the, after you've gotten through the analysis, negotiations, et cetera. Uh, I see no harm in it, but the statute doesn't require you to provide yep. it. So, how about... The common one, owner's list. This I want the owner's list. I want their email, their birth date, where they live, all these things. This is actually one of my favorites because I think our statute is very clear in this that uh, an owner is entitled to the owner's name and mailing address. This has been challenged actually a couple times where owners are trying to say, well, the term address also includes email addresses. And when you look through the statute, you do see references to electronic communication, emails, etc., except there, where it says an owner is entitled to name and address. And every year, frankly, except this year, it didn't happen. Um, there's a bill before the legislature to require the management company or board or the, uh, the site to provide the email address mm -hmm. of owner. And, and the legislature to date, as well as the industry, has said, look, People want to live in their home in quiet enjoyment. Yeah. They don't want to be badgered. And of course, even though there's a requirement, you can't issue that list to anybody else. Does the Amway salesman, I think against Amway, but you know, do they get it and does it get used for unintended consequences and purposes? So owners and, or listeners need to know that the board has no obligation or the management company has no obligation to give you more than the names of the owners and their mailing address. And their mailing address. That's and, it. And, and that's the end of it. 
Now, of course, we realize in this day and age, there's probably other ways to get that information without even going through the board or um, through the managing agent, but they can spend their time on Google looking for it. And one of the other common questions, you know, because you, know, you can request anything from the board, and it may not be enumerated in that long list of what you're entitled to, but can you get the email between board members? But that's, now you threw me again. And okay. You're going to fire me eventually. But, <laughs> you know, a lot of times the board members do make their email or an alternate email available for conversation. It's not just the email. The, board, the answer is no to that. But if you and I are going back and forth on a discussion on painting the roof blue or whatever it may be, can I demand as a record all the email we've sent to each other? Well, it, that sort of creates a problem, though, doesn't it? So yeah. we're both board members, and there are three other board members who were not privy to that conversation you and I were doing via email. That could create a dangerous well, uh, situation. It's a, it's a sticky wicket because the reality of it is that certainly if you had a lawsuit going, they could subpoena it, you'd have to provide it. Yes. But as far as a general record keeping under the statute, that is not listed as one of the items owners can get, and that is the email among the board as a whole or board members individually or whatever, that is not a document. But what is important to note is that owners can request any document they want. The board doesn't have to give it to them if it's not enumerated in the list, yep. but the board does have to reply in writing within 30 days. That's right. They're either going to give it to them or not give it to them and why. You can't, the board can't say, okay, we've got this request, but none of the documents on here are the required ones, so we're not even going to respond. That would be the wrong thing to do. Right. And believe it or not, we're down to one minute. We haven't finished <laughs> records yet. But we could probably finish records in the next three or four minutes of, the, of next week's show. Yes. And, and so at that point in time, I'm going to thank you again for being here and putting me up with all my abuse. You know, and I give you lots of abuse because I have great respect for you and we've been doing this a long time together. And thank everybody for watching Condo Insider. And we again invite you to send us questions, send us email, contact us so we can help answer your questions. And we will see you again hopefully next week and aloha.